Hello, everybody. Welcome to Got Your Back, brought to you by DLR Vinyl Products. You know, nobody puts in wood windows or siding anymore, so we ask you, why would you build a wood fence or deck? If you've got a project to do, do it once, do it right with high-quality maintenance-free vinyl. Call my brothers, Rick or Rob, locations in Calgary and Edmonton, that is DLR Vinyl Products. It's that time of year. If you've got a project, knock it in, but do it with high quality maintenance free vinyl decking and fencing. No worries about staining or painting. It goes in once, so you get to sit back and enjoy it. All right, a fine morning to our friend Terry Ryan and uh, joining us on the telephone today, which means we get to put up whatever ridiculous picture of him we want, is uh, Jason Strudwick. Uh, Struddy, how are you? I'll send you one of my modeling pictures. Oh. There's many good ones to choose from. <laughs> Just ask my wife. Uh, yeah. How, how was the hairline back when those were taken? Still strong. But it's all about the face. No one, no one knows what the uh, frame is like on the Mona Lisa, right? They just know the Mona Lisa is beautiful. So that's how I operate, right? Hair doesn't matter when you got a face like this. Yeah, yeah. TR, can you hear Strud's okay? Making sure technically we're good here? I can hear Strud's okay. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Yeah, we got you, buddy. Hey, you know what I have to say, TR? I don't know if this is going to be offside of me to do or not. But uh, Struds, do you know anybody that prefers to send the, the voice note instead of the text message? Yeah, I do. I do know a couple of people. Is that T TR's move? T TR's one of those guys. And yeah. TR, I gotta, I'll be honest with you, buddy. I love it. And here's, what, here's why it's I so love it. Easier. Because I know it's easier, but I, I, I've told you this before. You, you have to voice your own books on audiobook. You have one of those voices. I wish... I have the same voice that you do because your voice is like between the, between the slight accent and the, uh, the tone of your voice. So I'm, I, we're trying to line up logistics on the show and this is what I get back from TR this morning. Check this out. Okay. I'm literally just about to press record on my, uh, preamble for my podcast, which should last like about that long. I might need five minutes. Just give me a text at that time. Okay. Yeah, like it's just so much better than a text message, TR. Hey, and it's much easier. I look, I the more time I can spend not looking at my phone and typing, the better, right? Because not only for the social media, like too much social media or any of that, I just don't like staring at it for my I don't like it. And I find it freeing. I've made the decision. I can drive around, you know, I can text while I'm driving. Of course I can. I'm just speaking into the phone. I'm having a conversation. Yeah. And I don't have to listen. There's, there's not as much bullcrap talk. You know what I mean? Like, I, it's not as much, well, how was the weather today? Pretty good here. To, listen, the reason I'm calling is, no, I can just drop it. Hey, I need three books right away. Can you send them to this address? by Boom. You know? More more gets yeah. accomplished. It's efficient. Here's another one from like a week ago. I got a Yo, Shogster. Um, so I'm in Toronto now, obviously. Today, you don't have much on the go. Tomorrow, we're doing that press jump it all day. Um so I'm not sure the exact timing. When would you need me? We need you anytime we can get you, TR. That's when we need you, buddy. <laughs> Already. That would have taken Love me, it. you know, two minutes to type all of that. And I would have been staring <laughs> at the phone. And I probably would have got, gotten caught in some clickbait or some struts tweet something about the Oilers or whatever it would be. And then all of a sudden you're in a conversation. I avoid all of that and I enjoy my day. And I'm on the phone when I got to be. Yeah, it's awesome. It's I might have to adopt that strategy because I, I, I love getting them. I love pressing play instead of having to read. <laughs> okay, well, now that I know that, I'll leave you one today too, Struts. I'll leave you one ahead of time. Struts, your hair is like the sleeve of my peewee hockey jacket. Hanging on by a thread, there's not much left. And it really wasn't nice in the first place, was it? <laughs> <laughs> all right all right enough uh, shenanigans here there was a hockey game last night and people want to hear us talk about that and before we get to the breakdown our first ever audio drop in here on the got your back podcast uh, before we get started with the guys uh news just coming down a short time ago the darnell nurse will have a hearing with the department of player safety for the headbutt that he threw in front of the net uh in last night's game as you look at the video that uh, seems pretty obvious. Not sure how much of an argument there's going to be there. So interesting to see what the NHL decides to do with Darnell Nurse. Needless to say that if he were to get suspended, 
Uh, that would be a massive crater on the order blue line in this, the biggest game of the season that is upcoming. Potentially could get away with a fine here, uh, but we shall see. Heading to the airport, getting on a flight to Los Angeles. There might be another update while I'm in the air. Uh, and if there is, um, we'll just have to live with the fact that the podcast is a little bit dated. And now back to your regularly scheduled programming. Time for the breakdown. Brought to you by Park Mazda, where the newly redesigned 2022 CX-5 has arrived. Check out the brand new all-wheel drive sport design trim with its turbocharged engine and see the available colors and trims in stock at parkmazda.ca. Strutty, we will start with you. Uh, I don't know that I've ever carved a team as hard on television as I did the Oilers last night on SportsCenter because of their start, but it just felt necessary. I try not to do that too often, but it just felt necessary. Uh, was that as bad for you, their start, as it felt uh, as what I saw? So the Oilers had a great game two and three, right? Their energy level go high. They were coming at uh, the Kings. They did a lot of good things, scored a ton of goals, didn't give up much. At game four, the Kings raised their, their level um, you know, to a level I didn't think they could get to. And you know, going to game five, the Oilers knew that level. They knew what they had to get to. They had to bring that at least to compete with the Kings. And to start the first year, they weren't ready. And, you know, it expressed itself in many ways. Uh, but number one being the shot total. You know, what did they have? Five or six shots after the first period at home in game five, a really uh, a pivotal game in this series. And uh, they, they just didn't bring it. And, and, you know, you hear the guys talk after the game, why not? Why didn't we do this? Why? You know, at the end of the day, it's each individual player's responsibility to be jacked up for a game that important. So, no, I mean, I, it's, it's so it's just obvious it's clear you know you, you you can we can all say what we want but at the end of the day they weren't ready in a pivotal game and i think that is what one of the biggest disappointments for me last night tr what was your take on uh, the order start yeah I, i'm mystified it's like jekyll and hyde um it's two different squads sometimes and and it's you know they they must be ready they know what's on the line I hate to keep comparing this, but the two series are very similar. The Leafs are the same thing. They're either, you know, they're, they're either all in or they're laid back and they're jokey and they're not engaged. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It, it, when I watch the Oilers, you know, they got so many players that are so dynamic. And I don't mean just McDavid. I mean, Archibald's going around hitting everything that moved. Like, like some guys seemed to engage, some weren't. But I found some lazy passes. Um, I tried to. But Bouchard wasn't on the power play, Yamamoto a couple, just really soft and, and plays that they wouldn't normally make. And here it is. They're exhibition type plays and it's the playoffs. But when they turn it on, you know, if the game had lasted five more minutes in the third period, there was no way L.A. were winning it because when they get momentum, they really get it. But, you know, sometimes their best players are blocking shots and going end to end. And other times, like Yamamoto is a great example. I love his spunk. He threw some hits. Yeah. He had he had one a shift that nearly turned the game around. But then I two agree. shifts later, you know, just do the same thing. Be consistent. I don't know. It's weird. You know, you take that 10-minute window where they came back in that game, guys, and look at the intensity level and the sense of urgency. And then think about how big this game was, how important this game was. Why can't you take that sense of urgency and that intensity level and plunk it down at the start of a hockey game. And this group struggles. They've struggled all series long with their starts. I put a couple of questions to Leon Drysaddle post game as we go to our Average Joe's sound box. Average Joe's next to Home Depot on Baseline Road in Sherwood Park. Uh, here's our exchange. Anything happened there in that opening frame and why? Uh, yeah, we just got um, out skated um, early on and. Um, once, once we found our legs, um, it was a lot, a lot better for us, obviously. But um, yeah, five, five goals against obviously isn't going to cut it. I know this goes without saying, Leon, but the starting games are obviously something you guys are battling with a little bit right now. How critical is it to find an answer, and where do you think that answer lies? The answer lies in the room. Uh, we just <laughs> we we got to come out a little harder, a little. Uh, or we, we, we got to come out with our skating legs underneath us. So skating legs underneath us, for whatever reason, they don't have those skating legs. Strudge, is it your read that it's nerves? Is it inexperience? Like, what is it that's causing them not to meet that moment? I felt like in the moment they had spurts, and I'm going to talk like in the second period there, and they got it going and towards the end of the game. 
it started with hit and on the four chip. And there was a number of times where, you know, the, the, the puck would be chipped in or dumped in, and boom, all of a sudden, right away, they were on it, they got a hit, and then separate the D-man from the puck, and now they're on the cycle, and they're getting going. When they go in there more casually, they don't have the same, they don't get to the top with the same intensity, and they don't get that same result. It seems to me, when they start with, it, with that idea that I'm the intention of coming hard in the zone, with speed, getting contact, separating player from puck, it gets the whole shift going. I think they got to come out with set a tone for each line. Okay, what are we trying to accomplish here? What is our line going to be known as? And, and you know, if you're skating like this, if you're a physical line, be that. But everyone's got to set that physical tone because when they do it, you think of yellow mole and sit behind the net. All that stuff, things start from there. And that brings energy to the group. TR, what's your, uh, you know, do you think the moment is catching them off guard? Like, these are guys that have played in important games their entire lives, and they've been guys that are leaned on in those moments, but it just seems to be getting away from them early here. Yeah, yeah. Don't have our legs getting away early. This is, I'm sorry, but these aren't excuses. These are NHL, even if it was rookies, what do you mean you don't have your legs? What do you mean? The entire country, your city more, more than anything, but the entire country is waiting to, for a few teams here, Canadian teams, to make a move. You got a couple of superstars, you got enough stars you gotta you're, you're deep enough at this point you've been waiting we've been waiting for years for this we've been waiting it's two to two you got a game back at home here you are here's your fans the anthems have been played pump up music is on now you're ready what the hell are you talking about you don't have your legs you don't have your legs the only thing you should have is your legs i could see if you make a mistake because you know the, the moment got you but I, I have complete control over my legs and what I do. I can flip the puck in the zone. I can go make a hit because my legs are always there. I find that an absolutely ridiculous excuse from an NHL veteran or veterans or whatever you're going to say. And it's, to me, it's time to shit or get off the pot. I don't want to hear that excuse. Don't even give us that excuse. If that was the excuse, just don't say that was the excuse. If we don't have our legs. I mean, I don't understand any of that. And for me, it was conscious decisions. If I'm playing on a team and the shots are nine to one and I have a power play, I say, let's get three or four shots so it doesn't look ridiculous on the scoreboard. Perception and momentum are part of the game. And if it keeps going, boys, it looks bad. We're supposed to win this game, come out. It's 14 to one now, shots on net. They had a power play and they were going around dipsy do. And I know they're good at that, but fire a few on net. At least make it look respectable early or else the other team gets momentum. Hey, guys, we're right in their building. We're out shooting them. They don't even know what they're doing. They're giving it a... They're making lollygag plays where we came to play. Maybe the last time a, a, a recent, so quote unquote dynasty, if you want to call it that, came out and said, well, you know, we didn't have our legs like Patrick Kane or Sidney Crosby or Steven Stamkos in the NHL final. Yeah, well, we didn't have our legs tonight, maybe tomorrow. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, I, I totally agree with the TR that there are things you can control early in a game and your legs should be one of them. You should be able to control how fast you're skating and the decisions you're making. I, I get it if you don't have your hands for whatever reason. I get it if you know you're a little bit slow to, you know, decision making, whatever because of the moment. But I completely take your point that your legs are what you do have and what you should be able to rely on. Um, I thought dry side, there was a soft play on the wall on the first shift. Um, from Leon Dreisaitl, Jesse Pugliarvi, soft play on the wall in the first couple minutes of the game. Ryan McLeod can't handle a basic pass through the neutral zone and then misplays it at the far blue line. Uh, shots are 9-1 to one before you can blink. And, and Strud's, you know, your take on what TR is saying about... I mean, Dreisaitl has to answer the question. I don't know what he really believes the problem is. That's the answer that he chose. But what do you make of what you heard from them last night? Well, I mean, they're shell shocked, right? They're coming out, and he, you know, you don't really know what just happened. You know, you you, you start back in the third period, uh, and then you come out flat in the overtime. I, I'm, I'm, I don't understand how that can happen. I played this guy, Dave Bunn, Sam Bunny, his dad. I, I remember one time he came up and he was like, How do you feel? And I was like, Wow, I'm kind of tired. Like, no one cares. We got a big game today. <laughs> and, and that's how that time went out. Like, you are ready to play. Like, it doesn't matter. No one cares how you feel. No. No one, your teammates, the opposition, the fans, the media, the refs, nobody. You have to come ready to play. That's your job. I thought Kane did a pretty good job. You know, he took a penalty, came into it with an old. I thought that kind of got the guys going. Like, it's okay to show emotion. Yeah. It's okay to get involved in the game. And that's how you create that energy in the legs by getting going. You can't be meek. 
there's no weakness in the NHL or in any kind of hockey plan. You've got to bring the energy and create it yourself if you don't see that you're late. And you find that when you, you find someone, it's like those turns. You find someone and say, I'm going to make my boss life a living hell tonight. You find a way to manufacture the juice in your legs by the decisions you make prior to the game. Yeah. Strud's awesome stuff. We're going to cut you loose today. Your, your phone signal is a little bit wonky, so TR and I will finish the segment and land the plane. But great stuff today, and I uh, look forward to talking to you again soon, my friend. Big game six, guys. Talk to you later. <laughs> All right. See you, Struddy. Yeah, you know, TR, he makes a good point. So let's push it ahead to the next game here. And another moment is going to present itself to this group. On the road, uh, they've lost home ice advantage here, facing elimination. And that moment will present itself at the beginning. Um, you know, I know you haven't watched this team all year. I don't know what to expect from this group. I, I really don't. It wouldn't surprise me if it was 7-1 for the Oilers. It wouldn't surprise me if they were down 3-0 10 minutes in. And that can't be a good thing. Uh, that's not a good quality to be that unpredictable. No, I'll tell you what I expect. I inspect, I expect exactly what I, I expect inconsistency. I, I find, I, I mean, I, I, I peppered my viewing over the course of the year. I'm familiar with the team being out here. The game yep. runs so late, but I've enjoyed watching like start to finish. I really have. And, but I find that th th this team, it mystifies me because they can be so good. They really don't have a lot of weak links here and they got the like i said some of the best players on the planet so but the inconsistencies like they when they have to they play well when they had to last night they came back and they were not only do they play well they're dominant but i've never seen a team that can take so much control of the game and, and i mean I'm, I'm including hitting and offense and all of it because they can hit with the best of them when they want to but they do and, and then make so many no look hope plays like a team that does that usually is defined by that. They don't turn their back and saucer one into the slot when there's nobody there, hoping that there is somebody there. But the Oilers do that. They do it on, on, on the point. They're, they're, they're playing keep away like they're in Shinny and St. Bond's Forum, like for, for uh, you know, in, in the NHL playoffs. And yet they'll follow it up. I mean, watching McDavid on the power play and the people drawn to him and how many times all eight eyes are looking at him, 10, I guess, but the goalie, right? And they're looking at him and, he, and he, 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 he's mesmerizing to watch. And yeah. they got the power play because they worked hard. And there are other times during the game that, you know, I'm not knocking McDavid himself because he's beautiful to watch, but if, if everybody knows that and, and, and Dreisaitl has is one of the best hockey IQs I've seen ever, not just in this generation, those guys are out there and they're game breakers. And I mean, I can go down the list. You're talking about nurse Bouchard. I mean, even, even their fourth line guys like Cashian are premier. So I, I don't understand the Jekyll and Hyde. Like I, 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 I know lots of teams that have been like that, that, you know, you, it's a wing and a prayer and they go out or, or, or some players that just have had hard luck, you know, like Johnny Goudreau got a breakaway the other night on a, on a, on a penalty shot there. You know, if he yep. doesn't score that, you know, people say, well, Johnny got a score, but you can't really make yourself do that. I fell for him. Like, you know, last year, a couple of years ago, Mitch Marner, Marner was getting all kinds of shots. Couldn't, couldn't get free. Everybody's all over him, but he was trying. You just can't make yourself score, but you can definitely make yourself go out there and lock in. Right. And sometimes they're so locked in. And when the best player in the world is locked in, it, the, every, everything else is almost like slow motion. And when even guys like Yamamoto, they, like I said, he came out hitting. He's an offensive talent, always was Spokane. Uh, you know, I've been aware of him his whole existence, but he gets hot and cold. And so many of those guys, Pooley RV, like I said, when he's doing his job, man, no, he's a train in front of that net. No one's going to stop him. But so to make a silly little soft play on the boards doesn't make any sense. And when you look at Ryan O'Reilly, say, or a guy that's known for, you know, you don't, you don't just don't see that a lot. Other players that are in the same position. So it's not that they're not deep. I find they're a, a lot of their players, their own play isn't deep. They, it, on the surface, yeah. it's fantastic, but they don't dig deep i don't understand it it's inconsistent tr but if you look at the way this team was this season they came out of the gate gangbusters won a pile of games early then they went uh, it was one of the biggest flip-flops i've ever yeah. seen in a season uh, the same team that was one of the best in the league off the start turned into one of the worst teams in the league for the better part of six weeks and then their coach ends up getting fired a uh, new guy comes in and then they're one of the best teams in the league to finish it 
inconsistency and poor starts have been the narrative on this team all year. They gave up the first goal way too many times throughout the year. And I think when the playoffs come, you don't suddenly stop being what you are. And if what you are has been an inconsistent team, ups and downs, uh, yeah. plagued by poor starts, that doesn't just disappear because now it's a best of seven series. And I think some of that is catching up with them. And they got to find a way to exercise those demons real fast because they are running out of time. Yeah, and that's the frustrating thing as a fan. I really want to see them be successful. But if they're not, how no. long do you keep it together? And how, I know the, no one wants to answer these questions yet. Of course, it's morbid when it comes to talking about a team and the best players leaving or whatever they're going to do. But And, and I'm not saying it's going to come to that. But at some, at some point, what, what did Albert Einstein say? The definition of stupidity is trying the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. And yeah. th that's the thing that gets me. When I look at other teams, say, other teams that didn't make the playoffs, I don't know, the Islanders, the Canadians. If I was a GM coming in or I had to, at, at least I'd know what I had to work with. Okay, I'm an artist. Here's my, here's my toolbox. I'm a carpenter. Here's my toolbox. I know exactly. But with the owners, I don't know because each of yeah. their peak is so high. Like To me, each player right down the list is a premier player at their position. Right. So, again, it's not that they're not deep. I think they are deep. I just think that the with for some reason, the core of that team has it in their minds to, to be defeated or, or, or not confident or because that I mean, what is inconsistency? It has to be going out yeah. there and sure yourself. What is it? And I just don't see where it comes from. I love the stuff you're bringing right now. We are going to have to bounce because I've got some radio duties I got to get to and uh, time is crashing in. Yeah, on yeah, yeah. Here, but, and I ramble. I, uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. F-bomb didn't no, You're that. good, buddy. You're good. You're good. You're good. Uh, yep. Listen, great stuff. You absolutely brought the heat today and we love it. So we'll try and hook up with you again soon, TR. That was amazing. Thanks, my friend. We'll talk soon. Thanks for having me talk again in a couple of days. All right. Sounds good. That is Terry Ryan. And that was the breakdown brought to you by Park Mazda. I got to bounce. We're busy guys, what can we say? But still plenty to more uh, plenty more to come on the other side of the break. You're listening to Got Your Back, presented by DLR Vinyl Products. Hey Strutty, question for you. Have you ever tried putting in your own fence? I sure have. Between uh, digging the posts, uh, mixing up cement and, and uh, digging the holes, it's absolute killer. It's brutal on the back. Well, listen, what if I told you you could put in a fence without having to dig a hole or mix any concrete? I'd be much more likely to come over and help you out. Yeah, well, you're not the first guy I would call, but thank <laughs> yeah. you for that. Listen, my brother's company, DLR Vinyl Products, they've come up with a system where you can actually put high quality vinyl fence in the ground without having to dig a hole, without having to mix any concrete. They can teach do-it-yourselfers how to do it, and they can also work with contractors who might be looking to start installing vinyl. It's super high quality product. The great thing about it is that it has fantastic longevity. You put it in, you don't have to worry about staining or sanding or anything like that. I've been lucky enough, Strutty, they put in multiple fences in my different yards and they've built me three decks. <laughs> I have totally yeah, abused the yeah. fact that my family is in the fencing and decking business, but it's great product. Uh, give Rob a call in Calgary or Rick a call here in Edmonton. This is a company my dad started. It's a family business. I'm super proud of it and I'm very proud that they are our title sponsors. That's DLR Vinyl Products in Edmonton and Calgary. Hey, it's Ryan Rashong. While many are feeling the sting of inventory shortages, Park Mazda has you covered. They've got new Mazdas arriving every month, including the redesigned 22 CX-5 in whatever color you're looking for. They've also got a huge selection of used vehicles with new arrivals every week and some of the most competitive interest rates on cars, trucks, SUVs, and more. Park Mazda, your dealer for life in Sherwood Park, off Y Road. Schedule a test drive at parkmazda.ca. Time now for Duthy and Dregs, or R2-D2, brought to you by Bell Bank Construction, specializing in the design, planning, and construction of restaurants, office spaces, professional clinics, and retail spaces. Visit bellbankconstruction.com for any of your commercial construction or renovation needs. Nice to have both the fellas joining us today. Uh, Good to be Dregs. back after a two-week professional hiatus. Uh, monthly appearance by James Duthy. Monthly. Uh, Belvan's not happy, James. I got to tell you, I get daily texts asking if James is going to be part of the program or not. 
uh, with some pretty severe threats uh, if you're not going to be. Uh, tell the good folks at Valvan that I, I intend to be here every every possible post Oilers <laughs> game for the rest of the season. Sure, <laughs> which might be might be one more. Might be that many. I, I can wow. see your uh, I can see your intentions based on that uh, stack of golf balls over your shoulder there, buddy. So, if you like, uh, did you see what he just did? I mean, Duthie, who's a national multi award winning host, just basically guaranteed an LA Kings series win. That's what happened there. That is not Uh, what I did. You said one more. If I was to predict, I would think that it's going to go seven. That's not what I said. I was just having a little fun. That's what I heard, too. (laughs) No, that's what I heard, too. I said there could only be one more. There could be. 23 more on a Stanley Cup run. I, I no I've already, I I've already cut the, the I've already cut the promo and I'm pushing it out on Twitter right now. Duffy <laughs> predicts. <laughs> I would feel Scale. Look, I am I am entirely a neutral observer. I don't even have a favorite team. Some people mm-hmm. accuse me being a Sens fan because I'm from there. I don't care. But I think I want the Oilers to win more than anybody else because I feel so bad. <laughs> for McDavid and Dreisaitl and everybody out there if it happens again. And I feel bad for all of us as hockey fans yeah. if they lose and we don't get to see them again. So I, I, if I'm accused of having any rooting interest in the playoffs, it would be for the Oilers to, to, to go on a deep run. Hmm. Hmm. Drags, any suggestions on how they should be starting hockey games? Because I think <laughs> at this point, they should be open to them from just about anybody. It, I mean, their starts are just... They're horrendous. Yeah. And and last night kind of redefined horrendous, didn't it? You know, that first period was no good whatsoever. Uh, maybe Jay Woodcroft and Sheldon Keefe should spend a little time on a Zoom call like this and, and swap notes because, you know, the Maple Leafs didn't start strong either uh, in the first period. And it took Jason Spezza to, you know, get them kind of re-motivated going into the second. I I don't have an answer for that. And I, I don't know, you know, you're on those calls. You're in those rooms, Ryan. I don't know that the players can can honestly respond or reflect on why they don't appear to be ready. I mean, you do the same amount of preparation work as a player and as a coaching staff for every single playoff game. So it just comes down to human nature and whether you're ready for the moment or not. And uh, yeah, exactly yeah. Edmonton wasn't ready for the moment to start. Can, can I say something about... <laughs> the whole notion of players speaking up in the dressing room and us in the, in the media, obviously we make a a big deal of it because it's some sort of nugget that they get thrown out. I find it to be the most ridiculous thing ever. So does Jason Spezza come up after one period and say, Hey guys, we got to refocus. Okay. Uh, Margin for an error is really small. And everyone goes, Oh crap. Yeah. Never thought of that. We did. What have we been doing? (laughs) That's thank you. I I just, this is, it's the dumbest thing ever. These guys it's are professional not. hockey players. It's not. This it is spoken is. like a guy who's never played a team sport. Oh, design. here we go. Here we go. I can tell you many wow. times in the flag football halftime that I stood up and <laughs> yeah. galvanized the room. I'm just saying, look, I know that it does matter. And sometimes guys who haven't been there are, are spooked or a little bit lost. And I'm not saying it doesn't mean anything. But I just, in my mind, a professional hockey player should know that he should have been focused when the game starts and he knows that the margin for error is small and he should be able to process all those things himself and go out and do it in the second and third period of whatever game it is, the Oilers, the Leafs, whoever. All right, we're going to go to the Average Joe's sound box real quick here because you brought it up, but so did Austin Matthews. He brought it up, the fact that Jason Spezza had something to say after a dismal first period for the Leafs. I mean, I think the main message was just, uh, you know, that wasn't our best period and we just got to go out there and compete and, and get back to our game. And um, I thought we came on the second with a really good purpose and uh, started to compete harder, started to generate more ozone time and just try to wear down their defensemen and their, their guys in their zone a little bit and uh, started to gain a little bit momentum. Are you not inspired, James? Genius, genius. Hey, guys, <laughs> guys, we got to compete. We got to get out there and compete okay. a little harder. <clears throat> so here's the argument that I will make. Uh, It's not something that you do all the time. And when you're a veteran player, uh, you pick your spots. This is about how your teammates feel about you and your presence in your individual locker room. And if you're a guy who picks his words carefully, who carries a certain gravitas with himself, 
uh, when you choose to stand up in a moment and say what's on your mind, if you're not a blowhard who's constantly doing it, I think you can get people's attention. What do you think, Dregs? Is James is he being a little too hard on it? Like I buy it. Kamloops, 1998. Ryan Rashad steps up down three. Guys, look, I'm not going to be. I out never there. would do I, it. I probably won't get a shift in the third. But if you guys get yeah. Steve to compete, <laughs> Iggy, Iggy, like, are you going to wake yeah. up in this series? Are you going to be ready to yeah. play in the Let's second? Let's go, Iggy. guys. Iggy, carry your weight. Why do you have players only meetings? Right. I mean, it's because there needs to be some message delivered and whomever delivers that message doesn't always matter. In this case, Jason's bets carries a lot of weight. And what I would like to appreciate, you know, Austin Matthews and others gave us the flowery version of what he said. And if what he said was, we've got to find another level. Well, <laughs> <laughs> That's borderline ridiculous. I mean, there's there, there would have been did. a little bit more colorful uh, explanation of what was needed in the moment. But uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm leaning more towards James on this, to be fair. Oh, uh, because I think honestly, and maybe McDavid and Dreisaitl and, and the Oilers group are very similar. I think in those situations, when you don't start the way you want to start right from the drop of the puck, then you're looking at somebody else to get the momentum going, right? Maybe it's a save, maybe it's Matthew scoring, maybe it's a hit, whatever, all of those scenarios. And when that doesn't unfold that way, you continue searching. So maybe a healthy reminder isn't a bad thing. I, I want to clarify that I don't think it's a dumb thing to do. And I think it does have an impact. I just think it's ridiculous that you need to have someone say that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. That, that, that's yeah. the point I'm making, yes. Like, there shouldn't be a lack of motivation in these moments, right? There's no reason that the Maple Leafs no. should be sitting there at the intermission needing something other than, you know, just evaluating what just happened. Same for the Edmonton Oilers. Like, mm. it was it was one of the worst periods they played in, in you know, over a month, I would say. It's interesting, guys, because these moments happen, and you've got these superstar players who are the best of the best out there, Yet somehow, uh, you know, learning to rise to those moments and, and think about, you know, the Stanley Cup finals we've covered where Sid was involved or Patrice Bergeron of the Boston Bruins. It, you kind of have to experience some of these moments and maybe falter in them to learn the lesson. But for this group of stars that we're watching, McDavid, yeah. Dreisaitl, Matthews, Marner, boy, this is a, this, they're having a hard time grabbing this lesson across the board, James. Yeah, I, I find it interesting, though, like if you do a parallel between Matthews and Marner and McDavid and Dreisaitl, and, you know, we had all said before doing the Leafs game last night, uh, you know, Matthews and Marner have to do something at a critical situation, which they've never really done at a key moment this late in the playoff series, and it happens. And Dreisaitl and McDavid essentially did the same thing in that third period multiple times when the Oilers were in big trouble, but... The narrative is so different this morning because Kempe scores in overtime and nobody scores for Tampa. So Matthews and Marner rose to the occasion and our heroes and Edmonton's facing elimination when essentially, you know, the stars for Edmonton did exactly yeah. what the stars in Toronto did and what was required in the third period. They just didn't get one more save. Yeah. And I think that, you know, big moments, middle of the game, these guys are money. You know, yeah. you're down, you're 10 minutes left in the period, whatever. They seem to be able to elevate. Yeah. But figuring out a way to access that right from the puck drop seems to be a challenge for these guys. I heard you guys talking on the panel last night, Dregs, and this idea that maybe there was this moment that happened, a signature moment that, you know, maybe Matthews lacked in the playoffs, that that moment feels like it's happened. And if that can be a bit of a turning point for him, but it definitely felt yeah. like a moment to me, right from, you know, the, the great, shot passed by Marner off the pad, the Matthews burying it, the the goal celebration mm. after. We'll see that for a long time to come if they win this series. I would agree with that. And look, you know, not to give James Duthie too much credit, and it's incredibly cliche, and James is good at that, um, but we're watching the third period, and Duthie literally says it, it feels like this is an opportunity for a moment, right? For oh, that, Matthews right and or Marner. Um I don't know where he's gone, but we'll just continue to have the conversation. Uh, I, I mean, I liked Austin. Yeah, I liked Austin Matthews' game from you know about midway point of the first period all the way through. Uh, and Sheldon Keith clearly liked his game, or said to the group, "If if we're going to lose this game and maybe the series, then we're going to go down with our best players." And Austin Matthews yeah. is 
is undeniably the best player because he was on the ice a lot. You know, 23 minutes, 42 seconds of ice time. Uh, <clears throat> we've seen we've seen Connor McDavid be feisty and physical in this series with back to back four hit games. You know, Matthews recorded seven hits in in that game, game five last night. Um, but you know, Marner and, and Matthews didn't wilt as the game progressed and as the pushback from the Tampa Bay Lightning intensified as the game wore on as well. And, and that's a great sign. I mean, it, could it be a moment in his career? Obviously it is. But what's the next one going to look like? What's game six going to look like? Because to win, to eliminate the two-time defending Stanley Cup champions, Matthews is going to have to have at least one or two more moments like that. James, what do you think of uh, yeah? What do you think of the first part of what Dregs had to say there, James? Yeah. <laughs> hey, sorry, my uh, my 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 MacBook was giving me the you're about to shut down thing, and uh, so I had to run and get the cord. I wasn't ignoring or walking away from Dregs. I don't know what yeah. he said, but uh, I was making he, fun he, of you mostly. He, uh, he understated how great a call I made last yeah. night. I'll have to oh, give boy. credit. I'll have there to give credit to the O dog. The O dog was the one who talked on the early Sports Center about there having to be a moment. But in the, you know, I'm not a play-by-play -play guy, right? Uh, nope. Which is, which is probably a mistake by the network because in the <laughs> moment, as soon as they got the two-on-one, I said, I called, I was like, is this the moment? Yes! It would have been one of the greatest calls <laughs> in playoff history, except that we were no. sitting on a couch and, and nobody saw it. Yeah. Um, I, I missed what, some of what Drake said, but, you know, you can make, as we will in this market, so much out of that, and, and it's worthy of it for this day. Mm -hmm. But and, and it can be a signature moment for Matthews and Marner and, uh, you know, a, a change of narrative moment from here forward for the Leafs or it'll mean absolutely nothing if they lose the next two games. So, you know, you can hype it up all you want. And if they go on to win the series and go on a long playoff run, I think it becomes that. But if they lose the next two games, we all have forgotten about it by next year. Yeah, I mean, David and Drysaddle created their own moment in that game last night, you know, it, it, with that comeback. I mean, McDavid yeah. just basically threw the team on his back and just manufactured opportunities and goals, and Drysaddle did a great job, you know, burying when it mattered. Uh, that moment went poof like that. In overtime? To your point, James. Yeah, in overtime. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they came out guys, in overtime. Yeah. They started overtime and basically didn't even touch the puck. Like, yeah. like, L.A. completely dominated. So whatever happened in that moment at the start of the game, happened yeah. then they generate this amazing moment and then overtime happens and they wilt in that moment again it's it's bizarre but it can just go poof and mean nothing mm -hmm. if you don't follow through and that happened to them last night yeah it, it almost looked to me uh you know connor's game has elevated you know you see it all the time right yeah. like defensively he's he's a lot better so is leon dry saddle since the coaching change they bought in so i'm not going to question that on that play it looked a little bit like he was willing to cheat on offense, right? Trying to win the hockey yeah. game. Because how does Kempe just zip by him? You know, he gives him a bit of a stick, but there is no get up and go on the back check to try yeah. and, 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 and help the defense. And then you see Duncan Keith just flat-footed and stretching out to try and, and save. But Adrian Kempe is a quick-footed man. And he, yeah. he saw an opportunity that he was going to take advantage of, draw, drives the net, and, and scores the game winner. But there were a lot of big mistakes on a play from some big-name players. Yeah, I, look, let's face it. Duncan Keith had a brutal night, and Mike Smith didn't have his best night. And when that happens, doesn't matter what McDavid and Dreisaitl do. I mean, I guess they could combine for six goals or something, but you're probably not going to win. Do you guys think that if the Oilers go out here in the first round that all of that noise from your neck of the woods will start up as loud as it's ever been about those two players and whether they should be here or stay here? Or And, and let's be clear, it does come from out there. The, the people who work in the, oh. the the people who work in this market, it's not something that Are you is kidding on a mind or relevant. Look at I mean, it's always Montreal, comes from out there. Vancouver, Edmonton, Toronto, you can rank them whichever way you want. But nobody rides the highs or the lows more so than Edmonton media. That's just the reality, the situation. I mean, to a man, you guys piled on that team after that first period, like they lost game seven in the Stanley Cup. Like there was no point in playing the next bad. two periods. It was bad. I understand it was that. It bad. But don't I mean, throw we, the we garbage. report what we see. Don't throw the garbage that the narrative 
on whether Dry Settler or McDavid should stay together or whether it's time to blow up the core it comes from Toronto because that's pure nonsense. It does. Dregs, I'm sorry, bud, but it every time and where are you come sitting? up and grab the headline. You're in your basement in Sherwood Park, Alberta. So I, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm sensing a little bias. I'm not there. saying it's. I'm not <laughs> saying it's you guys. I'm not saying it's you two. Ooh, we but... live in Toronto. We work. We work in the national market of Toronto. Sorry, he didn't but... refer to it. If you, you, you know, he doesn't call it Toronto, Dregs. He calls it out there. Out there. <laughs> Everything comes from out there. <laughs> All right, you, uh, you he... people who live out there. You Easter guys. <laughs> You got me on that one. I definitely did throw that label on you guys. Wait, you know there. what? Look, look, I've, I have, I've not worked in, I've observed, but not worked in Edmonton media. I've worked in Vancouver media. I think Toronto media is soft. It's high in volume, but besides, you know, Steve Simmons, maybe Festchuk once in a while, or Cahal Kelly throws some stuff out there that's highly controversial or, you know, that aims to get clicks or whatever. But I, I don't. I think the Edmonton media and the Vancouver media is 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 probably as harsh or harsher than Toronto media. Now you're. This is a different. I'm, I'm a little bit apples to oranges because you're talking about the Toronto media talking about Edmonton from afar. That narrative. That narrative that comes when it, like, from who, out there. So when it, yeah, it comes from out there, who? who does Bruce it come Arthur. From? Bruce Arthur constantly oh. every year. Okay, just yeah. Uh, name the names. Uh, there are Oh, just put us all in one basket. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just well, mute them well, like Duffy did. Then, then you don't have to read his stuff. Uh, all right. Well, let's <laughs> let's let's just let's wait and see how this plays out because there's still a chapter to be written here. We'll see which exactly. way it goes for the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, I was gonna play a ridiculous game with you guys, but I I, I feel like I've changed my mind. This was too combative. Uh, I'm not feeling that close with you guys right now. I'm not sure it'll go well. I'm just going to cut it off here. So uh, awesome. thanks for doing this, James. I'm glad you showed up for work and yeah. uh, we'll talk to you guys maybe in a couple of days. Well, thanks for including us people from out there in your podcast. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Make sure you guys all get together and decide what the narrative is after this and all stick we together will. on it. Uh, that was R2D2 brought to you by Bell Van Construction, James Duthie and Darren Drager. Stick around, folks. Lots more ahead on the podcast, including of Letterkenny fame, Dylan Playfair shares a who's got your back story with us. That's coming up. Stick around. If you're a business owner looking for a general contractor to build or renovate your business, no matter how big or small, Bell Van Construction should be your first call. Specializing in the design, planning, and construction of restaurants, office spaces, professional clinics, and retail spaces, Bell Van can assist you from start to finish. Learn more by going to bellvanconstruction.com. Folks, golf season is just around the corner, and I don't know about you, but I am some kind of fired up over it. It's the perfect time to get yourself fitted for new clubs or some great new apparel. Well, DeBoer's has you covered for all of it. Their facility is first class with amazing TrackMan technology in their simulators and top-of-the-field fitting specialists. You can order now for spring delivery, and they've also got a bunch of new 22 apparel for you to go check out. It's a fantastic group down there at DeBoer's. The shop has a great positive feel. I highly recommend you check them out on the corner of 53rd Street and 99th Avenue. DeBoer's, helping you play better golf since 1999. Average Joe's Sports Bar in Sherwood Park has proudly served the community and supported minor sports in the area for almost 20 years. It's a great gathering place for sports fans. Average Joe's has massive big screen TVs, comfortable seating, and a friendly staff waiting to make your experience anything but average. Come check it out on Baseline Road, right next to Home Depot, or make a reservation by calling 780-417-1113. That's Average Joe's on Baseline Road in Sherwood Park. All right, time now for Who's Got Your Back, brought to you by DeBoer's Golf Shop and Fitting Center, helping you play better golf, your local golf shop, for the last 23 years. If you need absolutely anything for your golf game right now, from clubs to apparel 
uh, some swag, some company swag. Uh, the gang down at DeBoer's can basically do it all for you. If you want to work on your putting, they got a nice little putting green for you. You want to get into a simulator? They've got a couple of fantastic simulators for you to straighten things out and get yourself squared away before you spend the money and get out on the golf course. Uh, DeBoer's uh, Golf Shop and Pitting Center, uh, one of my favorite stops. Anytime I want to spend a little bit of money on myself, a little bit of time on my game, uh, love the shop down at DeBoer's. Uh, really excited about today's guest. Uh, he was born in Fort St. James, British Columbia. Uh, he is the son of a recent Edmonton Oilers member of the coaching staff. Uh, best known for the role that he played on the show Letter Kenny, one of those two hockey guys. You would know him as Riley. Uh, just an awesome guy. Met him at the rink one day. We got to chatting. And uh, when I reached out for him to come on the podcast, uh, he was more than willing to give us a little bit of time. And we're really excited. We've had a bit of a letter Kenny theme here lately with Terry Ryan, who, of course, uh, going to be part of the upcoming Shorezy as well. And it's, uh, yeah, pretty cool to talk to these guys. So in today's Who's Got Your Back brought to you by DeBoers, we present to you Dylan Playfair. Dylan, good to see you again, my friend. How are you, buddy? Right, I'm doing well, man. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah. So I made you do a little full disclosure. We made you do a, a little running around because we so we tried to hook up once, and the signal was no good. You were kind enough to change locations, but you're you're. I think we got her tight right now. It, everything seems smooth. It seems like it's working. It's well oiled now. Yeah, we got all the technical <laughs> difficulties sorted. Nice. Where are you right now? I'm in Vancouver. I'm at my uh, my studio here in Vancouver. We have a company called Media Button, and we do uh, mostly uh, uh, broadcast commercials. Um, yep. My fiance and I took over the company from from her parents, who started it back in 1995, I believe. Wow! And uh, yeah, they they ran it really really smoothly and and built a, a solid client base. And they were ready to retire. And, and Jen and I were kind of at the starts of our careers. And uh, yeah, we took it over. Th- three years ago. And, uh, it's nice cause it's, you know, we've got really talented people in here who, who understand, you know, the broadcast commercial world and, and corporate videos and things like that. Obviously I'm more in narratives, same with Jen. Yeah. Um, but it was something that I felt like we could bring some, some value to as far as what our experience was. And, uh, with the team that we got here, it's, uh, it's fantastic. I mean, I can't really sit still for very long, so <laughs> nice to have something to do when I'm not on set, you know? Well, you're like a media business magnate, buddy, like a jack of all trades here. There you go, man. You got to do it all. <laughs> yeah, no question. Uh, you just finished up a tour as well, didn't you? What? Uh, tell me what life is like doing that and what the what the show is all about. Yeah, so we took Letterkenny, uh, Letterkenny on the road called Letterkenny yeah. Live. And um, actually, I'm going to do a little name drop here. Uh, Ed Norton is a fan oh, of the show. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, very interesting interaction we had with him. And, and I think he put it probably the best way it's modern vaudeville you know so we've got two yeah. set of comics we've got a couple of uh digital shorts and some unreleased skits from from the the show itself and then uh, a couple of callback favorites that, that people recognize so it's a two-hour show and uh the pandemic actually helped us out a lot so originally we were planning to do it in 2019 and then obviously the world shut down and during those two years of, of COVID, uh, the show got a lot more exposure in the U.S. So we had to up a couple of venue sizes. We ended up selling out Madison Square Garden, the Hulu Theater, and the Cosmopolitan in Vegas. It was what? it was wild for us, man. Because <laughs> that's I mean, intense. Yeah, dude. We I mean, we shoot the show in Sudbury, and we we get a little yeah. microcosm of of our world, and it's it's not very big when we're shooting it. Um, but with the advent of, you know, media today in the streaming age, like when we went down South and the fan response was unbelievable and just kidding to see those, those theaters, you know, sold out and and to see how passionate the fans were and then to be able to deliver like a a solid project, a product on stage. It was, it was a ton of fun. I mean, we got to live like rock stars for two months. Yeah, I bet. I've always wondered with your characters because your shtick on that show is talking a hundred miles an hour, but it's really well thought out, funny stuff. And uh, I had Terry Ryan on the show not too long ago. Uh, he's been joining us kind of regularly. He's done a little bit there. Of course, he's part of Shorzy as well coming up here. Uh, I'm fascinated by the, you too, because there's so much dialogue. 
Like, is there any room for you guys to ad lib at all? Or is it just strictly like memory recall? Cause it's so fast. You guys dialogue just goes and goes and goes. You know what? It's funny. So everyone on the show really comes to set super prepared because it is that quick of a pace of a show, right? Like if you don't have your lines super tight, then you jam with the next person in the scene. So you really have to come to set knowing your, your, your lines inside and out. Um, but what we do is we call it getting it in the can. So you get it verbatim the way it's written. And then once you have it locked in a couple of takes, then you have a little bit more freedom to, to ad lib or to play with different moments or to play with different lines. But um, Letter Candy is one of the quickest shot shows probably in the world. Like, like really? most, TV, oh yeah, most TV shows will do a big page, a big day page is an eight page count and we'll do 20 pages in a day sometimes. Wow. Um, and, and you can kind of see it when you watch the show, like how quickly the characters are talking. Like you imagine if those were written words on a page, like you'd be clipping along pretty quick. Yeah. So you definitely have to come to set super prepared. And it's nice having like everyone sort of in a, a, a group or a click, like me and Andrew who plays Jonesy, we're in almost every scene together. So we have a rapport. We can, you know, we, we all room in the same building so we can all work on our lines on our off time. And then we come to set super prepared and we kind of have a rhythm for how our characters talk now. But it's certainly one of those things that you got to do your homework before you get to set because you can't show up and learn your lines on the day if you don't want to yeah, <laughs> look sure. like an idiot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Giso seems like a pretty cool guy to work for, but I wouldn't want to piss him off by showing up unprepared. <laughs> no, you, I don't think you show up many times you showed up unprepared because uh, like you said, you know, there's a bunch of other people that are that are waiting on you and, and watching. Yeah. So, and also it's a double edged sword having a buddy, right? Like you want to you want to do right by him, you know, you yeah, of course, sure when you get to set, you're making him proud as well because he's a great leader and he's a super good writer. And uh, yeah, we got some lightning in a bottle on that show. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you know, I, I, I didn't see much of it for the first uh, year or two that you guys had it going just busy and stuff like that. When I first watched it, I was one of those guys that watched an episode and I was like, what in the hell did I just watch? Like, whoa. And so I was like, I got to put on another one. So then I watched another one and I was like, oh man. And dude, I binged. I don't even remember how many seasons, but it was like a day and a half. And I was through all of it. Like once you get going on it, you just can't stop. You either are obsessed by it or you hate it. I don't think there's any middle ground with Letter Kenny. Very, very, very few people fall into the middle ground category for sure. Yeah, it's a polarizing show, absolutely. But hey, we're lucky we got more people, it seems like, on the positive side. Than oh, the yeah, for sure. Lots, lots of people that love it. So, uh, you, uh, new season coming up this summer, were you mentioning the other day? That's right. Yeah. So nice with the pandemic. We, uh, we shot two seasons back to back. So the most recent one was released on Christmas day. And, uh, if history repeats itself, uh, the new, the newest season should be coming out sometime around Canada day, which is July 1st. What's it like between wrapping up filming and waiting for the season to come out? Because you, you know, what's coming. You're probably really excited about how good it's going to be. That's gotta, that's gotta be a bit of a giddy feeling sitting and waiting. Yeah, big time. And especially for us, when like when we're on set, we're we're in the scenes that we're part of, obviously. But because we shoot so much in a day, like if, if our characters are on set, we're there for, you know, nine or ten hours. And the days you have off, you're usually preparing for your next day on set. So we don't see a ton of those scenes that we're not in for us right. to do when we watch it as well. So it's funny, like uh, people ask us about like the story arcs and stuff. And of course, you read the scripts. But when it comes to the actual scenes themselves, we're seeing them for the first time as well as the audience, you know? So it's, uh, yeah, it's a little, uh, little Christmas gifts in Canada, I guess, I guess you could say. Can't wait, man. Can't wait. Can, can you give us any hints on Shorzy? Do you know anything about Shorzy? I was trying, uh -huh. I was bugging Terry Ryan for details. He's got it on lock though. He will not say anything about that show other there, than just a broad detail. They're tight lit. I can, I can say this <laughs> much about it because what, what I know about the stuff they've released already Oh, is uh shorzy goes up country with a mission to never lose again <laughs> so he he wants to win ships <laughs> and uh a really cool part about it is they're doing it like it's based in sudbury and, the, and they yeah. mention the locale repeatedly so it's it, you know it, it doesn't uh it doesn't try to be anywhere other than where it yeah. is they, they use authentic locations they use a lot of local actors um you know i believe they shot in the, in the wolves arena like Nice. They, kept it, they kept it very true to Sudbury. And I think it's super fitting, right? Because Sudbury has produced so many great, talented hockey players. And yeah, it, it, is a, it is a big little town, you know? Like everyone seems to know everybody. And, and hockey's, uh, hockey's a religion up there. So it's a good fitting for it. I worked, I worked there, hey? 
Oh yeah. Yeah, I actually worked at uh, at MCTV in Sudbury. Okay. Was, uh, so I just finished playing junior in Kamloops, uh -huh. and I went to uh, broadcasting school, and I got a job right out of my first year in Kamloops. So yeah. I worked there for like a year. But then we were a little worried the station was going to go under and I had this job opportunity out in Sudbury, Ontario. I'd never been there, never seen the station, but the station manager saw one of my tapes and liked it and was like, yeah, man, we'll hire you. So sight unseen, I hopped in the car with my, my girlfriend at the time, drove all the way across Canada to sub to the big nickel yeah. and, uh, and just started working there. So I were, I lived there for about 10 months. Uh, through a hard Sudbury winter and yeah. uh yeah I grinded it out but I mean I you know listen man I was in Prince George BC too so I've lived in some, like well. you, you've lived some tough spots too man some hard winters yeah you know we did we've done one winter season and uh I think that was more than enough for the the crew yeah. to say hey maybe we lean back <laughs> into the uh, summer seasons because hey, it's lake country right like it's yeah. a beautiful spot to spend summers and not a knock uh, on, on on northern Ontario, but boy, oh boy, is it a chilly place to spend your uh, to spend your time, man. It's yeah. a dash 30, dash 40 some days up there. It's pretty chilly. Nice. Uh, I'd love to talk hockey with you, but we're taping this kind of before the Oilers game and the Leafs game. And by the time it gets to air, everything we have to all our analysis would be dated. But maybe we'll have you back sometime because we've had TR come back and uh, and he's done some uh, game breakdowns and stuff like that. Uh, you've got a history playing the game. I know you know the game well, so maybe we'll get uh, maybe we'll get Riley back to do a breakdown on some of these uh, playoff games if we get a chance. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds fun. Okay, so name of the podcast has got your back. I want your story. Uh, you know, was there a time in your life where you needed a bit of help or you're at a jam and, and you feel like somebody had your back? Two specific instances stick out, and uh, they're both kind of associated with hockey and, and acting, actually. So the first one was I was 19 years old. I was playing in the BCHL, and uh, I'd come off of a season that was uh, tough for me in a bunch of different ways. You know, I felt like I could I could have played another year. I probably... I know I could have, I got offered to go to the KI and be the captain of the Campbell River um, okay, yeah. KI team. So you were in Merritt, right? I was in Merritt at the time. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, it was funny, man. I, I was, it was after camp one day and I was, I was sitting in the dressing room and I just kind of, I looked around at the guys that were, were in camp and uh, I could just kind of feel in them something that I had, you know, the seasons before, which was this like, this hunger, this desire, this drive. And I felt that like something was missing. I had gotten my whole, I had gotten to where I'd, I, I'd gotten to in hockey by being a really hard nosed player, the hardest worker on the ice. So I always won the fitness award. Like I showed up to camp controlling as much as I could control. Cause I wasn't a super skilled guy. I was a hard nosed player and energy guy. And uh, I remember going home and calling my dad and telling him that I was like, you know, I, I don't really want to fight anymore. I don't really want to hit. And it's I, I I hope it's just a, a phase. Like this is the mental part of the game. Like something's mentally missing. And he was quiet on the other end of the line. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget to this day. He goes, Dylan, don't ever play the game past the point where you love it. Because this game has given you and our family so much that you want to be able to look back 10 years from now and go, hockey was good to me. And if you're yeah. at a place now where you're starting to feel like maybe you're going to resent it, that's a real good indicator that you might want to get out. And 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 to say that wow. to someone, who, I mean, my my whole game plan was to play pro. I was gonna you know go to college. Yeah. And I wanted to follow my dad's, and my uncle's footsteps. And this was at the same time where I was really looking at acting. I looked at Taylor Kitsch's career, and he played junior in the VCHL, and he'd gone on to you know he's still a super successful actor to this day. And I was talking to my dad about that, and he goes, "If you got that same passion to go pursue acting." that I saw you have for hockey for the last, you know, 10 years, he goes, you owe it to yourself to go do that. And it was one of the hardest decisions I ever had to make. But I remember walking in my coach's office and he, Luke Pierce tells the story better than I do, but he goes, you're the first player I ever had to cut himself. Cause I walked in and sat down and said, look, Luke, I, I, I'm I'm going to be taking the spot from someone who probably wants it more if I stick around. And I don't think I'll be as an effective player as I have been in the past because mentally I'm not in it anymore. And I don't think I would have been able to make that decision had I not have the guide, have, had I not had the guidance of my dad, who was at the time an NHL coach, you know, like yeah. he, 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 he knew the game well and, and he 
you know, he was instrumental in my transition from, from hockey into acting. So that was a time where, you know, in a huge way, yeah, but because I was, I was r- shit scared, man. I didn't know if I was making no. the right decision. I didn't know if I was quitting on myself, my teammates and the way he worded it totally changed my approach because to this day, I love playing beer league to this day. I love talking about the game. And I think, you know, in our time in, in, in ranks and whatnot and, and around the game, you see people who burn themselves out and when they retire, they throw away their hockey bags and they never play again. And he goes, that's the saddest thing that I see in the game. When guys get to the point in their career or they don't even want to be in a rink anymore. And he yeah. goes, don't do that to yourself. So that was a huge, huge. And then I, you know, I packed my bag. I, 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 I left the team. I moved to Vancouver. I started working hard on my, on my acting career. And, uh, you know, I went through the process of, of auditioning and getting an agent and, and doing a lot of the same things you have to do as a, a free agent in hockey, you know, finding a, finding a way in. And, uh, and through that process, I met Jerry Kiso, who at the time we were playing on a beer league team. You know, I got on a beer league team. I still loved playing. I still had the passion for it. And we went out and shot the Letter Kenny uh, uh, Problems YouTube series. So Andrew and I had been acting. We'd done a couple of movies together. I'd actually played Marty Howe in, in another hockey film. Like, again, this sort of these worlds keep colliding. Um, but when, when Bell Media reached out to, to Jared and said, hey, we want to make this, uh, this YouTube series into a television show, um, he, he was told that they were going to audition the hockey players. He was mm-hmm. going to be uh, casting the Letterkenny uh, uh, television series. And he said, you can't audition the hockey players. Those are the guys that were with me from the YouTube days. And uh, on a handshake deal, I told them I'd bring them with me. And um, I mean, I look back and, and how much of my career has sort of stemmed from what that show has, has, has given me the opportunity to do. No uh, those, are, those are the two biggest turning points, I think, in my career where someone other than myself played a huge part in, you know, really having my back. Like Jared didn't need to do that. And, and it was his first time being a showrunner and it was his first time going in with, with a big network like Bell and, uh, and he stuck up for us. And, and it wasn't until at the end of the first season that he told us that story because we'd already, and, and, you know, Andrew and I showed up to set with this idea of, Hey, let's make sure that, that we do right by Jared. Let's know our stuff. Let's be prepared. Let's, let's make him look good. Um, and then finding out, that he had done that, that he had gone to bat for us. Cause yeah. th- he tells the story. He goes, I didn't want you guys hearing from your actor friends that other people are auditioning for the roles of Riley and Jonesy right. because you'd done such a good job in the YouTube series. So um, yeah, man, it's little things like that. And, and I, I just, you know, very appreciative, very, very appreciative of, of, of those two instances. Cause you know, it, it brought me really close to my dad. I've always been close to them, but that's something that was, you know, really, you know, uh, a shaping moment in my life. And then same with yeah. Jared. I mean, that was almost, geez, that was eight, nine years ago now that we've been making this TV show. Yeah. I, I think about that moment that you have with your dad and uh, you know, to say, I think I might be done playing hockey and I think I want to chase being an actor. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not something that a lot of people go out there and do. And the hockey community isn't exactly, you know, Not everybody in the hockey community would look at that and be like, right on, man, go for it. You know, like it's kind of, it's a, it's a different thing to do. And I think it's awesome that you did it. It's worked out amazing for you, but for your dad to have that reaction in that moment, uh, and kind of help you dig in and find that, uh, Mm -hmm. when he has the stature that he has and had at the time in the game, uh, yeah, that's pretty meaningful. It, it, it was huge. And I don't know if I would have been able to go after this career path with such intensity had I not been sort of given the okay from him, because, you know, it, it, it is a little bit different when you come from a hockey family, right? Like my, I grew up in, in a rink, both my brothers at the time were playing in the Western league. My uncle played in the NHL and it was a really yeah. common question I get asked is what did your dad think when you said, Hey, I'm, I'm done playing. I'm going to go be an actor. And he was by far and away one of the biggest advocates of that and you know the conversations we've had since then he's like we're not that different you and i like when he started out you know you're you're doing everything you can off off ice to 
you know, be prepared for that opportunity you do get, right? Whether it's a call up and you get the, your one game opportunity to perform well, you know, every audition is kind of like a tryout. You kind of have to show up on a team and know your role. I mean, there are, now that I'm in this industry, I see so many parallels between the game of hockey and, and an acting career because you don't know where your break's going to come. You don't know which yeah. team is going to be the one that sticks. Hey, there are super talented hockey players that never get a sniff. And it's because if they're not in that the, in that team environment that you know their specific set of skills are being showcased, then you might not you might not rise those ranks. So for him yeah. to say, hey, like this is, and he told me he's like, I can't help you in this in this area the way I yeah. could have helped you in, in hockey, but I can I can tell you what worked for me and what I've seen work for players and 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 pass that information along. But he was really adamant. He's like, just don't ever get to a place where you resent the game because it's such a beautiful it's such a beautiful thing it's such a beautiful community and you know these people are, are good people and if you it was it was a lot about Luke Pierce too my coach at the time he goes if you step on the ice and your head's not in it that's not fair to Luke because he's trying to feed his family with the best team he can he's trying yeah. to go to the next level and it's not fair to the guy in your left and right if your head's not there and you know that he goes sleep on it you know think about it like really get your head you know, right and wrapped around this decision. But if you go to the rink tomorrow and you don't want to do the things that you used to want to do, then find something that makes you happy because, because this is a wonderful job. And if you start hating it, you'll start resenting some beautiful things in life. That's great advice, man. I think we all know a guy or two that uh, probably held on too long past the point of not loving it anymore. And it became this thing in their life that they, it, it never should have because uh, hockey is a beautiful thing, played a huge role in my life. And uh, I was able to, uh, to leave the game loving it. And I think it's a blessing when you can leave the game loving it. And the success you've had since leaving the game, man, um, it's awesome to see. Western Canadian kid doing what you're doing. You're crushing it. Letter Kenny's great. Uh, look forward to it. You've been in some other cool stuff too. I was checking out your filmography. You got the Mighty Ducks Game Changers, uh, Mr. Hockey, you were in the Gordie Howe story, Descendants mm -hmm. 2. Like, what else have you been most excited about that you've accomplished? Uh, honestly, Descendants was a cool one. Because yeah, that, that's Disney, right? That's Disney. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, that was a huge, big budget production. I mean, when I walked on set for the first day, they built a full size pirate ship in a green screen studio. And uh, it was a three-month filming process, two months of camp learning. It's a musical, right? So there's a big dance number. And I remember when I first booked it, I, I talked to Kenny Ortega at the audition. And right on the, right on the call sheet, it said, hey, like, or on the audition side, it says, like, professional dancers. And I'm like, Kenny, I'm not a dancer, man. Like, just so you know, <laughs> like, I, can, I can act. I'm pretty confident in that. But this whole dancing thing, that's a little bit out of, uh, out of my wheelhouse. And he goes, I've, I've done my research. I know you're, a, you, you come from an athletic background. I know you played, you know, junior hockey. And uh, if you're an actor, then you can get into that character. But all I need you to do is just trust your body and trust being looking stupid in the beginning. Yeah. And we'll, we'll make sure that you, uh, that you get there. So uh, that those two months of, of training and learning those moves and working in a team, it was Again, it was one of those parallels that I never thought would be so similar to hockey, where it's like you get this big group of people, we got to strive for a common goal, and the friggin' workouts, man. Oh my God. You wanna, <laughs> Who would have thought, about, eh? The dancers. Dude, eight hours a day of nonstop dancing. Holy, dude, I, I got in better shape in those two months of dance camp yeah. <laughs> than I ever did <laughs> training for hockey. And it sounds yeah. wild. But, dude, I tell you what, dance as hard as you can for eight hours and tell me you're not white. Yeah, but working out for hockey, you were just all, like, bench press and abs and buys and stuff. Eh? Yeah, like, yeah. It's, uh, it's not, you're not training for show, for dance. You're training for, like, stamina and strength and all that. Not like, uh, not like I'm sure. I don't know if you trained the way I did for hockey back in the day. But, uh, yeah, that's impressive, man. Eight hours a day. It was, it, it was, it was insane. I, I still to this day tell my hockey buddies, I'm like, guys, the hardest I've ever had to work Get with. Get into dance. Get some moves, man, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, having it do well, right? Like, especially something I wasn't comfortable in. That was yeah. that was something I'm, I'm, to this day, very proud of. Very well, proud of. congratulations on all your success. Can't wait for the new season of Letter Kenny. Uh, you're getting married, too, aren't you? When's that coming yeah. up? Yeah, August 18th. Hey, it's going to be a great summer for you. So, congratulations. Thanks for sharing your stories with us. Uh, they were awesome. And will you come back sometime? Maybe we'll talk a little more meat and potatoes hockey with you. Love to, man. Love to. Thanks for taking the time. All right, Dylan. Thanks, my friend.
Cannot wait for the new season of Letter Kenny. Also looking forward to our first look at Shorzy when it comes out. Uh, big thanks to Dylan Playfair for joining us. Reminder, we want to hear your story as well. If you have a story about a time in your life where somebody had your back, well, send it to us. GYBpod at gmail.com is our average Joe's inbox. GYBpod at gmail.com. We do read our listeners' emails. We love to hear your stories. So please send them to us. Uh, we have some that we're going to get to in the coming weeks here as we continue to knock off podcasts, but we're always looking for more stories. Uh, that'll wrap up another episode. A big thanks to our sponsors, as always, DLR Vinyl Products, Park Mazda, Belvan Construction, DeBoer's Golf Shop, and Average Joe's Sports Bar in Sherwood Park. I got to go hop on a plane. Back to Los Angeles we go. Will it be the last trip of the year? I wonder. Uh, man, Oilers really got to get their starts sorted out. If they don't, even if they do get past Los Angeles, they're not going anywhere in the postseason. You can't be a team um, that does not show up on time. Championship teams just don't play that way. So they're going to try and get the ship righted, get things back on track. A huge game six coming up. And uh, Got Your Back will be in Los Angeles with the Edmonton Oilers. So thanks for tuning in, folks. I will drop a podcast in the next couple of days. Have yourselves a fantastic day. Cheers.